today's guest is Bruce Hughes. He is a stroke survivor. He has had to face something we will all have to face one day. But here he is to tell his story with humor, passion, insight, and something you can't just describe somehow. There's a spark in him that is spectacular. Hope you enjoy the conversation. So thanks for coming. Glad to be here. Dennis. It's been a long time. Yeah, glad to be here in, in many respects. Huh? Yes, many <laughs> respects is right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in my intro, I will have mentioned you know what you've been through in the past mm -hmm. year. Um, but to hear it from you, a short version, and then we'll d dive into some key bits. Okay. So maybe just bring our audience up to speed about what Mr. Hughes has been through this past year. Okay. Uh, eight months ago, May 31st, woke up feeling not very well. I had been home. My wife had broke her back in a car accident the uh, previous November. I've been home taking care of her, and I, I said, I'm not feeling that well. You haven't driven in about six months. You should go see if you can drive because I'm not sure I can get you to your doctor's appointment uh, the next day. And about an hour later, I went to get up and just boom, uh, my arm, you know, the signs. Uh, I was pretty sure I was having a stroke. And uh, she called 911. 911 came. By the time they got to our house, um, I was sitting up feeling fine, talking well, nothing bothered me. They did all my vitals, checked me all out, couldn't find a single thing wrong with me, said I was incredibly normal, you know, my vitals. So I said, well, you know, I'd like to grab a shower and then I'll go to the emergency room. Uh, my wife took the dog, she was going to go for a walk and uh, they didn't get five minutes out and the dog turned and drug her home. And I was upstairs in the bathroom and the big stroke hit. And I was laying there on my last breath, thought I was going to die, and heard the back door open. And I just got enough breath to call her name, and she called the second ambulance. And they came and transported me to Fredericton. Um, that was, I think I get in there about 11, 11.30 in the morning to emergency. And for the next three, four hours, it was just chaos to me. Um, and then Dr. Boma came on the scene in the afternoon and she took one good look at me and she figured what was happening, grabbed my wife and uh, said, I think I know what's wrong and it's a really serious stroke. And if we don't try this new procedure, um, it's gonna be catastrophic right here. So with that they intubated me and sent me to st john and that's all i remember till they brought me out of it the next day and uh the next morning in st john general hospital or regional hospital i guess it is yeah. um they had performed this procedure on me and what they didn't tell me was you know they told me it was risky but they didn't really kind of you know say how risky um and then when I found out later that, you know, the 3% or so that had lived previously was trying this in the test trials, uh, most of them, if not all of them, were paralyzed from the eyes down. So I had done some work in the past with brain injured patients and, uh, and a family member that had a stroke up at the Stan Cassidy. So I, I had some knowledge and knew about neuroplasticity and stuff. So when I woke up, nothing uh, worked at all. I was totally paralyzed from the, like, the neck down. And within a couple hours, my left side come back pretty strong. And then my right side uh, had nothing. So I knew that there, you had to, it's literally mind over matter. So I thought, I have to lay here for four hours to get this giant tube taken out of my throat. So I'll just lay there and I stared at my right elbow for you know quite a considerable amount of time. And then it finally moved a little bit. And my brother noticed it and... Uh, he was quite excited, and I said, um, in my mind, because I can't talk yet or anything, uh, I thought I've got to look at look at this again because it might have been muscle reflex or something. And it only took about 15 seconds the second time. So I knew I had made this connection with my brain to my right side, and I thought, I'm going to do everything I can because I know time is the enemy here. So I just laid there, and by the next morning, I could wiggle a little bit, a few fingers and toes, and the doctors were freaking out because they had never seen anyone come back like that. So, and I've been recovering ever since, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and, and your laughter is wonderful. Well, 
I, I learned in the hospital um, when I first got into rehab, well, well, just in general, like hmm. if you don't find something to focus on, you can go dark pretty quick. Yeah. Your story of um, focusing on your elbow mm -hmm. and trying to get it to move reminds me of uh, Deepak Chopra, who came to Moncton 10, 12 years ago, did a little lecture. I was to promote his book, um, Reinventing the Body, Resurrecting the Soul. <laughs> yeah, very fitting. Yeah. <laughs> and he tells a story of um, a neuroscientist in Montreal at McGill, actually. And he's acting it out on the stage, almost like Richard Pryor would act out all the different characters here yeah. on stage. And uh, so the patient's on the table, the doctor's saying, I'm going to stimulate this part of your brain and I'm going to raise your arm. Right. So, and the arm comes up. Okay, now I'm going to stimulate this part of your brain. I want you to keep your arm down. And over, you know, 15, 20 seconds, the arm wants to come up and you could tell the patient was, Psh, no, kept the arm down. So neuroscience will explain it in mechanical terms. What Chopra was interested in was the power of the will. Yes. Like, where did that come from in the first place to create the new synaptic connections? And you just did it. Yeah. Well, I, just because I had that knowledge of uh, from the past and working with patients, and now I was one, right? So I, I knew I had to do something, and uh, I thought I've got to start retraining my brain right now, you know? And the first six months is very crucial. That's when you get your big improvements. Hmm. And I was, every day, like I was seeing the improvements, not just the, the physiotherapists and nurses and doctors I was working with, hmm. but I could see them, and that motivated me even more to try harder. And, you know, we, we met, uh, we were athletes in our day, you know, and so uh, the physiotherapists and stuff knew that, and, and they knew I could be worked hard and wanted to be worked hard, so... Yeah. It really helped, but but having that, you're right, that mental uh, mind over matter, that willpower to say, you know, damn it, I'm going to get better, hmm. you know. And when all odds are against you, like um, my doctors, even my uh, Dr. Baum and my uh, neurologist, uh, it wasn't until I saw a later interview with her <clears throat> that even she, when I left for St. John in the ambulance, fully expected me to die or be, you know, physically debilitated for the rest of my life so mm. when i come back a few days later to the hospital she's uh she was there before i got there and the nurses even said to me uh we've never had anybody on the floor before the patient got here we knew you were a big deal yeah. right and of course i didn't i hadn't been in a hospital since i was two so yeah. <laughs> this was all new to me i'm just yeah. you know what's going on here and uh when the when I got transferred back to Fredericton, it was at my request because m my wife with her broken back and my mom were traveling from Fredericton to St. John for the first few days to see me. And I'm like, she can't do that. She can barely walk, you know? And so I said, I'll take whatever bed's available. And uh, so I, I was in St. John. I woke up in St. John. Yeah, it happened Tuesday, I think, or no, Wednesday morning. And then I woke up Thursday morning in St. John, and then they had found me a bed by Friday. So when we got to Fredericton, they wheeled me into a, a room, a ward, they call it, uh, with four of us. And there was three guys in there, 192, 195, 198. So in my mind, you know, they've given me very little chance. I'm in the goner room, so to speak. And uh, I just laid there for the first... I don't know how many days it was before I could walk or move or like I couldn't even go to the bathroom alone. It was just such a scary experience to be totally dependent on everyone else. But I refused. Uh, still to this day, I never pushed the buzzer for help. Mm -hmm. I would wait, you know, if someone happened to be there or, and I was just like, just give me a pee pass, I called it. Just let me go to the bathroom on my own and I'll start from there. Mm -hmm. And eventually they did and you know, I could take myself into the bathroom and that was freedom. You know, the first time I got up in a walker, that was freedom. You know, if it gets as, as this is as good as it gets, you know, okay, but it's better than yesterday. So hmm. it, uh, it's been quite a ride and, and I don't know if I'll write a book on it someday. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if I could re go over it again, but, uh, yeah. E even now talking about it like this is okay. Oh yeah. Oh, I, okay. I'm, I'm fine. I'm, uh, I've spoken a lot about it. I've done quite a few interviews. Um, 
I've also, uh, I'm on two committees now with the hospital as a patient <laughs> experience advisor, helping them out. And uh, I'm going to see maybe, you know, if I get better in the next six months to a year about maybe turning it into a job, you know, mm. like, and do this for the rest of my life, help other people. Because uh, <coughs> the announcement that came out on Friday is just huge. Like it's, a, you know, as Dr. Blackyear said, it's a game changer and, uh, and I'm living proof that this new procedure can be done. You can survive at the, you know, I was out of the hospital in 51 days. You know, there's some people that don't even get on their feet for like five, six months, you know. Um, I got my first weekend pass in nine days, you know. And, and <coughs> so I had a lot of things going for me. I mean, besides a great team that I had behind me, um, I guess my age, you know, I was 58 at the time, and that's pretty young to have a stroke, apparently. Um, but that that works to your advantage because you you know you have that willpower and drive and you know physical capacity to to give it a good effort, I guess. But it's been pretty wild. I will say that. Your internal conversations must be pretty good. Um, I I'm not. I'm a doubter. Like, it doesn't come out of me. People think I'm so confident stuff. Internally, you know, whether it's music uh, teaching when I used to do that or public speaking, whatever, I still get the butterflies. I just I just wing it, I say, you know, and whatever comes out in that humor again, right? You use that humor to overcome that nervousness. <clears throat> but in those moments when you're starting to question, is this it? Yeah. That's, that's profound, and here you are able to talk about it. Well... I'm I'm really happy to be able to talk about it. Like, <laughs> as they say, um, it's nice to be seen because it could have been a lot worse. And uh, when they grabbed my wife and there's 10 or 12, or it seemed like 10 or 12, there just was constantly people around me at my bed in the emergency room trying to figure out what went wrong. Uh, I knew I was stroking, but they couldn't figure out where or why because one side would drop out and then I'd sit up and talk normal. Uh, then one side, the other side would drop out, and it was my pupils. Um, Dr. Bauma, when she was doing her residency at McGill, she said she'd only seen one stroke like this in her life, and it was because my pupils were so small and staying that way, and I think they still are that way, and they may stay that way forever. She said that's how I knew it was uh, what's called a basilar arterial dissection, which means I tore my one of my brainstem arteries. Um, and then the blood started flowing in between the two walls and created a, it was peeling it like wallpaper and created a flap. And that's why we would close that off and then clots would form and then a big one would force its way through and then to close again. And people say, well, you got two of them, right? Well, that's something else I discovered. And it's a fairly high percentage for people and you don't know it until you've had an MRI CAT scan or a stroke or something. Um, of the two brain stems, and it's usually the right, but the left does, um, doesn't quite develop properly. So it's it's not, you know, it's there, but it's not really working. And that's what happened with me. Once I tore the left one and created that problem, I didn't have the backup. So my case is the only one where the type of stroke you have, um, where the timeline goes out the window. And she just, just explained this to me the other day because she said that there is no other option. We try this even if it kills you, but you're going to die anyway. So no one was more surprised than me to wake up the next day and then to be paralyzed. It's like, yay, I'm awake. And then it's, oh, <laughs> you know, this is another whole set of problems. So uh, once I could wiggle a few things, I went, I've made that connection. There's hope. And I'm just never going to stop. So once they got me into a walker, uh, there was a lady, she was a f private physiotherapist that had heard about my case and they were like, no, no, nobody's come back from this type of thing. And so she came in to see me on the weekend. Even the nurses were kind of like, what's she doing here? You know, <laughs> oh, the new guinea pig. <laughs> yeah. So uh, she came in and, and put me in a walker and it was just so nice to get up out of bed. Like I, it was just days and I was, you know, like bed sores and, you know, you're aching so bad and just to get up and spread those hips I was like oh god so we went out in the hall and she had me do a little walk and 
we went maybe 50 feet and she goes oh, okay well we better go back and i said no <laughs> <laughs> so i just kept i said i'm going to the end of this hallway and back i said this feels so good i can't i'm sorry i'm not disrespecting you but i'm going and so she come up beside me and uh, she says, I've been doing this since the mid-90s. And she said, no one's ever fallen. Don't you dare fall in front of that nurse's station. <laughs> and I said, I won't. <laughs> and I didn't. And I walked down the hall and back and then went back to bed. And again, there was a day that I knew I was going to get better. You know, there was, there was hope again that I could walk. Um, but that took, oh, it was a grueling. I was down in the rehab wing within, I think it was nine days which is very quick for them because at first you go up to the stroke unit, which is uh, in four Northwest, and they just take such good care of you. And then the rehab unit, if, if you qualify for their criteria, there's 24 beds. I, had, I didn't sleep for the first four days, and in the first nine I had 12 hours sleep. Like, you just can't sleep. And just to backtrack a little bit, when they first brought me to Franklin in that ward with the three 90-year-old guys, I, I didn't dare go to sleep because I thought <laughs> they're just waiting for yeah. me to die, right, and wheel me out in the middle of the night. So it just, you know, the paranoia creeps in and stuff. Yeah. And uh, But, yeah, 12 hours sleep in nine days, and then they shipped me down to rehab, and they had just found me a room where I could sleep because I, after four days of not sleeping, I went to the head of the night nurse, and I said, listen, I haven't pushed the buzzer. I haven't asked. I said, but I really need some sleep, so you've either got to find me. Well, I'll crawl out on that lobby couch out there. Um, you got to find me somewhere to sleep or I'm checking myself out and there goes your research. You know, I, like I was using anything to, to advantage my, you know, advantage my case. And then they finally found me a room and then I get shipped down to rehab into another ward situation with a, an industrial blower blowing in my ear. So, you know, no more sleep again. So I'm fit to be tied and pretty crabby. And I said, uh, you got to let me go home for the weekend and get some sleep, and I'll start again Monday. And I and I was pretty rude about it. It's probably the one day I, I was not pleasant to be near. And uh, and they listened. And after that, I came back Monday a little bit refreshed and knew there was hope. And it began. And six weeks of every day grueling, you know, work me, work me, sweating, and and it paid off. Yeah. <clears throat> a thought comes to mind. Um, do you get the sense that your body knew how to remember how to move? There is a lot of science now about uh, cellular memory. Yep. And connecting that with, you know, uh, our neurosystems and synaptics. Yep. So the way you describe it sounds very much like all you had to do is make that connection because your body already knew what it wanted to do. It wanted to walk to the end of that hallway. It, it wanted to wiggle, and and so it might be that everything you'd done to this point in time really helped you, of all things, yeah, um, get through that crisis that you were in because your body knew what it wanted to do. Yeah. So, so muscle memory, cellular memory. Oh, definitely. Memory, all that. That's uh, even throughout the physio when um, they would ask me to do something and I couldn't do it yet. I would say force that leg, like bend it for me. Do it a couple of times, then the brain will remember what it's supposed to do, and then I could do one on my own. It, you know, maybe not full, but it would start that connection. Uh, same with music. Um, the, I, I'm a self-taught guitar player, so muscle memory is important to me. Mm. Uh, it's one thing that has changed. I, I, don't, I don't retain like I used to. Like the old stuff is in there, but the way I input the new stuff is different, and I'm, okay. I'm struggling with that right now. But, you know, it, it's back. About 75%, I'd say, and I just have to learn new ways to make my brain work. But you're absolutely right. The muscle memory, or cellular, or whatever you call it, yeah. um, I would tell them all the time, force my limb to do it. Uh, for example, these two fingers here on my right hand didn't work for at all for about the first three weeks, and it bothered me tremendously because, you know, I thought, well, I could hold a pick, and, you know, but these will get in the way. Yeah. And I'm like, is there anything we can do? And and Dr. Obama said, well, you know, that, that that might be the deficit. You know, that might be the line. And I just said, no way. I was sat in my room because I wasn't sleeping anyway. <clears throat> I sat up all night with my hand held over and just 
willing it. And it started just from a little trickle like that. And within 24 hours, I could bend them. And she came in to see me the next day. And I went, this is what I did last night. And she was so impressed. Like she, like every day they were like, we can't believe how you're responding to this. We've never seen anybody do this. And uh, I said, well, then study me. You know, let's let's make this, you know, this procedure, and I said it then, game changer, and I was glad to hear Dr. Blackier, Blackier use that uh, terminology on Friday's announcement, because right. in my mind, I could see this benefiting right. others, and, and even though it was such a rare stroke, <clears throat> not all strokes could have it, right. um, there had to be someone else out there like me, you yep. know, that would benefit. And, and there's another dimension to add to that. Well, science can do what it does and medicine can do what it does. There's there's the Bruce Hughes factor, <laughs> you know, because yeah. because of the uh, this stuff that Chopra talked about, that, yes. that intangible thing that science will never be able to measure, but is the seed of our energy or this, where we come from, that initial spark. Fear is a wonderful motivator. <laughs> <laughs> I've always known that, but it, this is in a new context because it was... It was fear at first. Like, when I first came to, it was so scary. Like, I mean, you don't know where you are. You've got this giant tube down your throat, people around you. You know, I'm trying to explain. And my wife finally figured out. She's like, he wants that damn tube taping him out of his throat. And then this nurse leans in, and I can see her face, and she's like, you know, talking like I'm deaf or something, you know, the doctor will take that out at 10 or 1030. And as she pulled away, there's a giant wall clock right there. And it's six in the morning. <laughs> so I've got to lay there. That's why I say I stared at my elbow because I knew if I started focusing on the tube in my throat, it would drive me crazy. And I, you know, the, the minute some limb worked, yes. I would try and drag it out. Yeah. So I had to occupy my mind just to keep myself from scaring myself i guess you yep. know it, it fear is powerful that way or the flip of that would be the love part it's like no friggin way i'm i'm gonna do this well i don't uh, love a life maybe i i something i drove. think the fear factor was was big at that time because okay. my wife and my mom were there and one thing about a stroke uh when it happened you had your emotions i mean i would just oh my god i would think of my poor dog and burst out crying or my mom would walk in the room and I'd start yes. crying and apologizing for it and you're just emotionally a wreck you know mm -hmm. and uh it's just you learn later it's all part of the stroke because of the way your brain is swollen and and the part of my brain that it affected and uh, and just over time but, but you're you know, at, yes m much respect for that but you're you're at such a, a major threshold I mean we all have we'll all come to that threshold one day and, and to not force of will, because that would be like the common language. I'm after something more intangible that we haven't tapped into for a long time. Yeah. About who we are, where our spark comes from, uh, that thing that makes us us. And so it was almost like an invitation to, in these circumstances, Mr. Hughes, what are you going to do? Yeah, challenge. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, ice bucket challenge, sort of. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. I, 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 that's not my... Uh, I don't really spend a lot of time on that. I, I attribute it to fear, being very strong-willed or stubborn. I, I say people say, oh, you're so strong. I'm like, well, no, stubborn is probably a better <laughs> word. My mom would probably agree with that and my wife. But um, fear, stubborn, and just great doctors. You know, like this province, I mean, you were a small province, we're a have-not province, this and that. But you look at what those surgeons and, and radiologists are doing in St. John. Uh, Dr. Boma, my neurologist here, she's a New Brunswick girl. Um, just these are top shelf, world class people and they saved my life. So, I mean, you're not gonna catch me saying anything but really good about them and, and attributing their uh, profession and, the, and their caring and their, you know, in my case, they had to go in and put a heart stent to repair that uh, artery. And, you know, oh, there's a complication on the way. What are we going to do to fix that? Oh, well, let's take this part. Well, but that's for a heart. Oh, well, but it might work over here. And to have that confidence to try, you know, instead of going, oh, well, that's not what the rule book says. 
you know, if they'd have followed the rule book, I'd probably be dead, right? But they're going, you know, we've got to try it and look at the benefits. Now it's, they've extended the guidelines. There's going to open it up to 24 hours, you know? So I think he said they're figuring like a couple hundred people a year that they can now save or, or save them, their family, the grief of major de de debilitation. Uh, you know, there's always going to be some, but it could have been a lot worse. You know, and should have been like uh, that article. You know, I keep coming back to it. Uh, Catherine and did a great job of following me around and covering the story. But the opening line in that article, Bruce, you should have died, right? You know, when I when I see that, <coughs> it kind of still just saying it gives me a chill because I should have, you know. But good doctors and just good circumstances and that unknown. Yeah. <laughs> You touched lately on it. Um, this province has an awful lot of skill sets and an awful lot of talent. We don't have many places to tell those stories. Yeah. Our healthcare system might be a lot better than what mainstream media tend to portray it as. Do you have thoughts on that? I know you had a particular experience, but also you, you've been in and around. Yeah, I, I'm in that hospital quite a bit. And, uh, you know, I, I'm sure everyone's experience is what guides their judgment or whatever. Um, <clears throat> I've seen nothing but great, you know. And the way I equate it is, yeah, you can gripe about, you know, too long in the emergency for a cold or your kids are there or whatever. You know, my wife and I don't have a family doctor, so we were totally at their, you know, I needed help throughout this entire process with everything. Uh, a, I didn't understand. B, I couldn't do anything about it. And C, I had no doctor. So to to see what I saw, or, or you know, from my point of view, is uh, put, your life in, put your life in their hands, and we got a darn good system. Yeah. You know, and this procedure and me being here proves it in my, in my eyes, you know, and a lot of other people I know too because I've, I've realized... We've got to let people know this is out there, yeah. you know, that that the neurologists at, at our hospital at Dr. Everett Chalmers are just as good as anyone in the world. The, the guys down in, uh, and girls down in uh, St. John doing the heart and brain stuff down there, they're world class, yeah. right? I mean, they rewrote the guidelines that they announced on Friday, right? This is going to be huge all over the world in my mind, and I hope for a lot of people that just... It's another option on the table to, to yeah. save you. Yeah. And I can see the, the in their faces when I see them in reports or, or interviews and stuff, they're nervous, but, but they're darn proud, sure. you know? And I always ask, I don't care who the nurse, the doctor, whatever, I would always ask them, where are you from? Yeah. And I bet 99% of them were from right here in New Brunswick and they wanted to stay in New Brunswick. And I thank them for that, every one of them. I, I would just thank them. I couldn't tell you how many of the nurses and stuff, you know, just from the bedroom communities around here. And they're like, no, I want to stay in New Brunswick. And I'm like, wow, we're lucky to have them, hmm. you know. Good. How you doing so far? I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> Can we take a turn? Uh, because we're tired of healing, it is music. Sure. One of your other great, oh, I love music. One of your other great passions. So how long have you been a guitar player? Uh, I bought my first guitar in 1979. And I didn't get serious about playing until, oh, for about five years. So I just kind of picked around. And then I uh, I decided to go back to university. I was living out in Alberta and B.C. and places around, you know, moving around. And, and I thought, it's time to go back to school and finish off my degree because I had, I had left here and went to the, one of the big oil booms in the late 70s, right? I, I think it was in my third year when I quit here. And uh, I thought, I'll go out and work. So I worked a few years, and then I decided to go back to university and went to the University of Lethbridge. And uh, while I was down there, there was a guy I knew from a band here. He was the McCain's rep, um, and we shared a house together. So, you know, on Sundays we do what we call rock and roll housework. So we put a record on and strap our guitars on and want to vacuum, want to be doing the dishes or something, and a song and come on. He say, "Okay, now here, you know, C G D or whatever," and that's how I learned. And then I taught myself after he moved out. And then when I moved back here, I got into, you know, started a little band and playing parties and this and that. And then eventually we got to the point where we were getting invited to play clubs and. 
that went on for well from the mid 80s till 99 <clears throat> and then i had had it with the music side of it you know we'd done some recording and some pretty big shows and I was kind of the business side of it, and and it just got to me, yeah. you know. And it, was it enough to make a living on? Oh no, this was a side project. The the early band we had, we were all teachers. We all worked in schools. Like it, uh, Dan was a music te and still is the music director over at Presque Isle High School. Alan has his own schools over in Maine, charter schools. Um, uh, Dave Cunningham worked at uh, UNB, and I worked out at Upper Keswick or Woodstock or some of the schools in town. Like, it was our side job, you know? And But back then, it was like, you know, it was a good second income. Sure. Um, the days of doing it for a living, I believe, are just about over, you know? And unless you've got a whole lot of original stuff and you don't mind touring, you know? Sure. But, but music is an interesting thing in the brain and in the body mm -hmm. to loop it back to dealing with a stroke and in recovery from stroke. Mm. Because music also has that intangible in it. There's the mechanics of the notes yep. and the structure of a song. And then there's always something bigger than all the sum of its parts in a song and the way it all connects in your brain. So do you have a way of describing what it was like when you when you picked up the guitar again? And and you talked a little bit about your fingers and your hand technique, but but the other side, because something happens when you hold a guitar or hold your instrument, and and you morph or you shift and you become this player. I was hoping it would do that, but it didn't. Ah, no, uh, it was horrifying mm -hmm. because the stroke affected my right side. My leg didn't kick in until probably August, so I just basically drug it around, and David will tell you. And, and I have bad knees and ankles from our basketball days, so it, it gave the uh, physiotherapist fits. They actually sat me down and thought we were going to have to get braces or maybe do operation. And I was like, no, I'm, you know, let me at least get back to some type of walking, and down the road we'll think about that. But uh, the occupational therapist, Amanda, said well why don't you start bringing in your guitar and i said yeah that's you know that's what i want to do is is see you know i'll make that my therapy instead of you know doing woodworking or painting or whatever you know the communal things they have you do in rehab i said that's not for me you know this is my piece of wood i'm gonna work on this yeah so she said yeah bring it in so i brought it in it came like i would go home on the weekends and come back monday to friday and i brought it in and the first time i took it out of the case I couldn't even get my shoulder up. Like, it was so fatigued. And the left hand's okay. I only, I only lost about 10% of my left side. And five minutes. And I couldn't hold a pick. I couldn't strum. I couldn't. And it was just, I put it back in the case and never touched it again that week. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll wait till next week. Maybe I'll be better next week. And then the Monday came. She said, did you bring your guitar? And I said, yeah. And she goes, "Well, play it for me." And I said, "Oh, wow!" And one of the uh, one of the things they have you do is, is tap your toes together. Well, it's still to this day. I'm almost there, but it's not there yet. So my coordination isn't perfectly back yet. But it was like, <laughs> and she's like, "Oh, okay." <clears throat> so we tried to come up with stuff. Um, she had all the, our, our, it was called, not a grab bag, a grab box of hmm. things for me to do. And we couldn't find anything that would simulate playing. Hmm. So she she found, uh, it's an amazing little thing. She took two little medicine cups, taped them together and took some dried rice and put them in between and made me a little shaker. And that was about the closest thing to strumming that I could find, and that's how it started. I just sat there shaking it, and I couldn't, you know, it was just back and forth, back and forth. And then over time, I could chick -a chick -a chick -a chick -a almost egg. like one of those rhythm eggs. Uh, yeah, well, that's what I said. I said, oh, maybe I should get an egg. And then I, and I said to my wife, no, she made me this. I want her to remember this for the next patient, right? She's so creative that way. You know, she's like, well, if we don't have something, let's make something. You know, because I just couldn't find anything that would simulate it. And they said, well, it's just going to have to be playing. I thought, well, until I can control my arm and, you know, my coordination, it's not going to happen. So 
that was probably the hardest part of everything is no matter what's happened to me in my life since 79 I've ha I've had that guitar and I could sit by myself and write a song or or just play it it's therapy you know in itself and I couldn't do that anymore in what's argue well no arguing about it my most trying times the one thing I had is now you know the biggest challenge and I'm still not back at it. I'm back to band practice, and we and we did a we did a show uh, December first, Tom Petty tribute, and that was a lot of fun. Um, one of your former guests was there too, Sleepy Driver, and there was a whole bunch of bands, and everybody was like, "Wow, you guys are really good." And I said, "Yeah, but I can hide in a band. <laughs> right? yeah. If they stop playing, yeah. I'm pretty horrible still. Yeah. So it's going to take some time, but they've been great about it. And uh, over the winter, we're working on original material." and uh giving me a chance to rehab that way instead of you know yeah uh, so we, we haven't mentioned the name of your band yeah the new group's called the unheard there uh i just love playing with these guys this uh vaughn evans on lead guitar uh charles will be on drums and bob fitzgerald does most of the singing and bass for us but the three of us sing and uh you know we're more of a rock band the old band was blues you know like i did at the festival and stuff hmm. Uh, the Blind Dog Days, but uh, The Unheard is a rock band, and now we're starting to do our own material, and I just, I can't wait until we're ready to come out, you know, we've got a few gigs lined up for the summer, but we're always looking for gigs. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a YouTube? Not not yet, no. we have just like a Facebook page, because we're not that active right now, where That's I okay. can't, you know, I could probably maybe get through a set right now, but there's no way I could get through a whole night. Okay. Like, just the fatigue factor is just too much for me, you know. Yep. I'm full of energy right now, yeah. but <laughs> 8 yeah. o'clock tonight, I'm pretty yeah. pooped. But but the mental and physical focus needed for playing an instrument and then playing in a band when listening to everyone, it's, it's pretty intense. Yeah, it's... I'm having a harder time than I thought it would. Like the boys, you know, they're very encouraging and, and very forgiving and, and and they just think it's amazing what I'm doing. But in my mind, I'm still like, you know, come on, like yeah. get there, right? It's like another, enough of this sitting around. Yeah, it's, <laughs> another, it's another version of walking to the end of the hallway. Exactly. <laughs> but but now um, what I used to see on almost on a daily basis of improvement, it's like monthly or biweekly kind of thing. And it's just a, a bit more frustrating, I guess. Um, and, and I got to get back to where I was at least because, you know, I was just a rhythm player that wrote, I mean, I'm no fancy lead, hot shot lead player or anything. So if I can't even do my rhythm parts, you know, what's the point? And, mm. and I'm not, not, I can sing, but not a great singer. So, you know, mm. but I'm hoping to get to, uh, back to where I was because I just love playing with these guys and we have just such good camaraderie and chemistry and, uh, I just want it to work, and and I, I really can't wait to get this original material out there. Great. We'll take another turn, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, another one of your passions, I know, are politics. Oh, man. Provincial politics. <laughs> you and so, I have talked politics. So be gentle. Okay. <laughs> Watch your language. Okay. All that good stuff. It might be, as we go into an election this year in Little New Brunswick, that... Mm -hmm. um, the ground might be kind of open for something new to happen in this province that's never happened before, which would be the idea of a minority government. Yeah, I'm a big supporter. Um, there is an, from what I get for feedback, there's an awful lot of frustration with the two-party system. It was percolating 10, 15 years ago, but seems to be reaching a different critical level this time. It's also five choices, as well as independent candidates. That's going to mean the province, uh, the voters, going to have to do something that they've never done before. Um, Forty percent of them are going to have to show up instead of opting out, and then have a different range of of awareness yeah. that you do have these choices. Yeah. Um, you've been following this for some time. Do you want to play in that space a little bit and and share what your thoughts are? Well, it's it's funny you bring this up because, I mean. I have a degree in psychology and political science, so I've been a news hound political junkie all my life. And having the stroke got me out of that cycle, like that daily cycle of following the news and just caring and ranting and, you know. And so now I almost use it as humor, right? Like, I mean, for the American side, I'll turn it, uh, like, I'll look at my wife if we can't find something, and I'll just look at her with this 
grin and say, let's look in and see what Trump is doing. You know? yeah. And we laugh because, and albeit nervously. Um, so, so I don't have, it has changed my take on things, but yeah. from the perspective of New Brunswick election and that feeling out there that you mentioned, I'm totally supportive of that. I, I think we would benefit from a minority government because uh, the two-party system and partisan politics just in general, I, I, I'm a believer in the independent, you know, candidate. I, I, I often considered that myself, but I think it was like you're only allowed a hundred dollar campaign limit or something like that. The odds are stacked against you from the beginning and, and I'm stacked in favor of the partisan system. But I would love to see me personally, um, a minority government with, with a third party or third and fourth third and fifth party with a balance of power and force people to compromise and do what's right for the province because Let's face it, New Brunswick's been a corporate state for decades, right? And those other provinces have followed secretly, you know, whether it's the Canadian Petroleum Association has watched Irving, uh, the, the media side. I was down there uh, when they crushed the union, basically. The papers didn't really cover it much. Um, there's just been so many studies and somehow it just keeps happening, just this back and forth, one team to the other. And I'm I'm sitting there and I'm going, you know, you've let two teams run this province and we're $14 billion in debt. Hmm. So at what point do you stop going to them and say, we've got to try something else, mm -hmm. right? What are your thoughts on um, those two teams um, being more or less the same? Economic policy, I find mostly uh, the red team seems to have more of a social conscience um, but economically, it's driven, and, and I think back often to when Frank McKenna got out, and his first day in office, and he's told the story, I don't know if it's publicly, and I don't really care if it's not, but um, he said the first day he walked always to his office, who was sitting in the room waiting for him but the three brothers from St. John. <laughs> you know, basically saying we run part of the province, you know, the other industrial family runs the other part of the province and you have your third and we're here to make sure you don't screw it up. So there's so many people, my family's from St. John, they're like, oh, wow, you know, lots of job. But, well, that's not how it works, right? A corporation's interest is not the public's interest, mm -hmm. no matter what you think. And that's what we've become in my mind. That's what I see is if it's good for them, it must be good for us. And it's not. We're $14 billion in debt. So, as it, I mean, that's a long-running New Brunswick narrative. Yep. The relationship between a couple of key families yep. in the province and um, the, the running of the province. Bruce Lebsay, who was a guest on the show. Oh, he's um, fabulous. It spoke much the same way. I'm curious to learn, where do you think the breakthrough will occur? Where can we shift the narrative? Where does the solution come from? Because if that's the way it's been for so long, and yet we feel it needs to change, yes. then what is that change? Well, when friends ask me, what can I do? I say, start local, right? Save your river, save your community, uh, get out there, make sure, don't, you know, people think voting every four years is enough. It isn't anymore right? Protesting isn't enough. You have to go take power from them, right? They're not going to give it up. You have to make sure your friend who you trust, you should go into politics. I will back you. I will get people to back you and make sure that candidate is someone that represents your community. Don't let the parties tell you who this guy's a good guy. He'll do what, you know. No, if he's in a party, he's going to do what the party is best for the party. Do you think uh, we could have a functional legislature if they were all independent candidates? Oh, I'm sure there'd be people that would kowtow it to, you know, and poo-poo it and you name it, but you don't know till you try, yeah. right? And I mean, at one time, I think we've had this discussion before, we're not everybody independent, you mm -hmm. know, you were just a, an upstanding individual that would represent yeah. your community and say, hey, my community needs a new school, my community needs water, right? And if that community trusted you to represent them mm -hmm. and you got that, by God, they'd vote for you next time, mm -hmm. right? Now it's like, I, I just, the, I guess it's the partisan side that, that really, you know, yeah. you, and it may not be as bad here as some places, but, you know, it's getting that way everywhere. 
right does, does it ever strike you that you know new brunswick's population is 750 to seven hundred seventy thousand mm -hmm. people um geographically we have proximity to each other uh, so we're kind of like a suburb in a way in, mm -hmm. a, in a bigger center those suburbs are run by independent candidates sitting on municipal councils yeah and it still works I know there's different infrastructure challenges and geographic challenges and stuff, but the principle of governance yeah. and population and scale um, means how do we get past that narrative that, no, you have to pick a political party because they win, and when they win, they're in power, and when they're in power, they'll go do these things. These things get done through a cooperative approach as well because that's what we experience every day at the municipal level. Yeah. So, I I think a minority could do that. Like, it would force you to get back to the table and say, okay, I can't just bulldoze the place, mm -hmm. so what would you really like to see happen? Well, I can't quite do that, but I might be able to do this, right? And and you get the conversation going that way. Get away from the politics, right? Get back to the humanity, community side of it. What needs to be done? Delivery. Um Canadian history tells us most of our progressive legislation happens during minority governments. Yeah, but try and tell people that. You know, the facts are there, but they don't believe it for some reason. Any thoughts as to why that is part of the narrative? Well, because to the benefit of, of uh, the two teams that win, right? You mm. know, they don't want you to know that. Mm. They want you to think that, no, I'm going to do a real good job of representing you, and those guys have no idea what they're doing. Yeah. And yeah. then they throw them out, and you, you know, and... As you know well, in this country, whether it's federal or provincial, we don't vote for something. We vote out something, yes. right? And then you deal with what you have in front of you for the next four years. Yeah. That's got to stop. Another common narrative and myth is that um, you have to be in power to get something done. No. So, so, or you vote for them, you're going to be wasting your vote. Is there such a thing as a wasted vote? Well... Whenever I, I get this topic, I remind people that if the 40% or 45%, depending on the election, that didn't vote got together, they could form a majority government and fix all the problems that they claim they know we have, <laughs> right? So, yeah, I would say there's a lot of wasted votes. Um, now, in the U.S. election, you know, between a lesser or two evil sort of thing, they somehow managed to even make it worse, in my opinion. But I, I think we have to get back to some type of uh, civics. You know, the, like I know at the school I was at, one of the elementary teachers started a citizenship program for like in grade two and teach them how to be a good community person and teach them what civics is about. It's not just about elections, it's about helping your community, giving back. Um, I, I just don't buy into this, you know, I got mine, you gotta go get yours, pull up your bootstraps kind of thing. Like if I've got plenty and my neighbor's hurting, I'm gonna go help my neighbor. And, and I, I don't know why we've gotten away from that. You know, it's like, oh, well, that's their problem, right? You know, and I'm like, really? Uh, and I mean, Call me socialist, call me whatever, but I see humanity as a community, not a collection of individuals, right? And uh, I've just always approached life that way, you know? My two best friends growing up, one was a Maliseet Indian, one was uh, from India that came over here with his parents. And they got called horrible names, and I would help them beat up white guys. You know, <laughs> like, I mean, I would just, they would cry, and it would make me cry and angry. That, why are you, they're really nice guys. So I never, in my mind, had a prejudice bone in my body. And I kind of look at politics the same as, like, what do you mean I can't talk to him because he's on the other team? You know, that's a guy I need to talk to because he's in the riding next door to me. And we've got a, a problem that's cross-border you know uh so it's just at one time i i considered public service and i got approached by a few parties but uh i don't know if i've got the skin for it now because i would and and since my stroke i i know i would uh speak a little more freely yeah. so to speak but but maybe that's something we should all do a bit more maybe it needs to come from that deeper more powerful place if, if you can contain it or control it a little bit because uh, like 
it helps keep my blood pressure down that I don't pay attention so much now. And uh, another journalist, I had promised him an interview months ago, and he contacted me on the weekend, and I had forgotten all about him, but he wanted to do it when my speech wasn't very good, and he wanted to do it over the phone, and I'm like, uh. And half an hour of talking to him and my blood pressure I could tell and I said enough I'm like this is why I don't yep. get into it too much anymore but with someone like you where I've had a few discussions over the years it's kind of fun and and part of the pleasure of the show is that we're not going to spend all the energy defining the problem no we're going to get on with what do we need to change where does this shift occur how do we help people see their way through this so part of it is the 40 percent that don't vote need to kind of get engaged you've got many choices to do it yeah. and then there's the age-old narrative that you know new brunswick doesn't uh, doesn't do anything new when it comes to its politics stories of uh, oh the hand of the grandmother or the grandfather comes out of the grave on election time and tells the grandchild you know this is how oh, you're yeah. supposed to be voting the family voting yes and like yeah. it's is it done yet are we finally past it have we reached a new critical mass or a new critical point in time that for all the challenges we have in front of us that are going to take cooperative approaches mm -hmm. rather than the the way we've been doing it. I mean, the Premier made more announcements this past week. They'll be rolling out announcements oh, right up election until election year. time. Yeah. And I'm thinking that's part of the problem because it teaches people that this is how we fix the problem. And yet it's the same approach we've had for 40 years and nothing's changed. You know, Stats Canada shows our unemployment rate went up a tick and there's been a huge shift towards part-time jobs from... Well, I could have read that in the 80s. Yeah. And yet the political solution that we're being provided as a choice is this. And that's what mainstream media covers as part of the narrative. We, we've, how do we shift away from that? Which means we got to maybe disregard mainstream media. People have to get more engaged. Yes. The engagement, education, and we need to kind of go back to that uh, front porch, right? Rather than back porch. Um you got to go start talking to your neighbors again, you know, find out, find out what they need. And if you have a similar need, then, and you know something, but just so, so many people are turned off that, oh, they're all the same. Well, they aren't all the same, right? I've, I've interviewed and I've known tons of friends that have been uh, politicians, cabinet ministers, federally, provincially, you know, really good people. You know, you're not going to tell me they're just like every other politician because I've seen them in action, right? But if you have that cynical view going in, is your mind ever going to be changed? You know, maybe maybe, maybe it's good they don't vote. I don't know. But I would like to see more engagement. And I thought it would get better as I get older, but I, I, it's not. Like in my mind, it's not. And I don't know if that's because of our education system, the media, as you say, Um I just don't understand because I, I've always had a passion for it about wanting to do better for your community or your, you know, public service or whatever. I really truly believe in it. Um, now my libertarian friends, you know, they're like, oh, you know, I, I want my taxes. I'll take care of my health. I'll take. It. Well, I asked my American friends because we were playing at the festival this summer uh, when they were coming to the hospital to visit me. I said, just out of curiosity, I said, when you go home today. Do, do an analysis of what this would cost me if I lived over where you were. And he came back the next trip and he said, just the procedure and the care you've had now, not even started, I hadn't started rehab at the time. He said, well, you'd be about a quarter million dollars, right? So I'd be basically bankrupt. I have to sell my house. You know, catastrophic injury would lead to catastrophic loss and my wife and I'd be living out of a car, you know? So we have some advantages, and I, I don't want to totally crap on the system, but people need to pay attention a little more. You know, instead of just griping, it's the old thing like when I was in school, don't just bring me the problem, bring me a solution too. And maybe it's not the right solution, but at least it's something we can talk about and work on, and then maybe we'll come to the conclusion that, well, that's not quite the solution we need, but yeah, that's a step, sure. you know? And just getting some more people engaged, you know? good people yeah time to wrap up how would you like to send that was us quick off? yeah <laughs> how'd, you, how'd you like to send us off um well for starters i i, I would get in big trouble if i didn't share this time is brain 
right? For every minute of a stroke, um, 10 million brain cells, right? So, so if you think or your spouse or whatever thinks you're having a stroke, 911 immediately because every minute is 10 million brain cells. And they're the, uh, what do they call them, the schematics or whatever. It's called fast, facial droop, um, arm, tingling and numbness in your arm, speech, and then T is for time. And that's why I say time is brain. So don't hesitate because this procedure, and I think it's 10 or 15% they estimate can benefit from this new procedure. It is a game changer. And I'm living proof that you can come back from, and I had a pretty, uh, they don't know how many strokes I had, but pretty severe situation. And our healthcare system figured out a way to put it, me back together and I'm coming back. So yeah. I have to thank them for that. And you know, Dr. Boma, uh, she's the one who said, don't forget time is brain and the fast. So those are, those are the things I'd like to leave. And, and just to thank uh, everybody that supported me, you know, to this point, you know. And thank you for having me in, Dennis. It's been uh, really good to see you again, man. Yeah, thanks for taking the time. No problem, anytime. And thank you for watching. Be good, have fun, love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon.